Today on Growing Boulder, how the world's most interesting man created a one-of-a-kind lifestyle for his family. Bill Schaefer has a rare interview with the queen of the American running revolution. How Joan Benoit Samuelson inspired millions of women to lace up and hit the streets. And I'm Laura Savini. We are checking in with neuroscientist and popular New York Times bestselling author Daniel Levitin. Levitin says he has the three key ingredients to successful aging. This is going to be a growing boulder must see. These stories and more today on Growing Boulder. We're not made to withdraw from life. We're made to seize each moment and to value every breath. We're made to be bold, to take risks, and to help others. We are the most creative, fearless, passionate being that has ever walked the face of the earth. Don't identify with limitation. Embrace possibility. This is not the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of what's next. This is Growing Boulder. Hi, I'm Mark Middleton and welcome to Growing Boulder where we share the secrets to living a big, bold life. And those are secrets that Bill Booth discovered as a young man. When Booth was a college student, he was driving in his car when another young man literally fell from the sky, landing in the road directly in front of him. It was a skydiver a participant in what was then an experimental and risky sport. Booth picked him up, drove him back to the airport, and forever changed his life. Now in his mid-70s, Bill Booth has composed a remarkable life, a never-ending adventure that began the day a skydiver landed on the road in front of his car more than 50 years ago. I picked him up, took him back to the drop zone, and two hours later, I made my first jump. Booth was the right guy at exactly the right time. When I started skydiving, parachutes hadn't changed in, in 40, 50 years, all right? It was right at the time when parachutes went from being a life-saving device or a military tool to a recreational toy. Harnesses were uncomfortable, openings were hard, and malfunctions were common. With the heart of an engineer and the spirit of an entrepreneur, Booth went to work. I started in a garage, just sewing equipment for myself, and now I've got three companies with about 150 employees. He designed and patented a new pilot chute and a rapid release system for malfunctioning canopies. He made the sport safer, and then he wanted to make it accessible to anyone, including the elderly and the disabled. So he invented the tandem harness and opened the floodgates to recreational skydiving. We had to develop systems. It's much more complex. Theoretically, much more dangerous than solo jumping. But the fatality rate is 500% lower. And the reason is, I wrote the rules to make bad behavior illegal. And they have to do it or they'll lose the certification. With global control of the tandem skydiving market, the world opened up for Booth. The Russians hired him to do what few thought was possible, parachute emergency workers onto the North Pole for rescue missions. He not only did it, he did it six times, once with his 12-year-old daughter, Katie. For her science fair project in eighth grade, she brought back eye samples and tested for PCBs and toxins oh. and things like this. And the girl before her was testing the effect of chlorine pools on scrunchies, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I, 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 and then the, the, the judge said, you you went to the North Pole to get ice samples to test for, you know, poly this? And she said, yeah. And he says, you win, okay. <laughs> Booth now had the equivalent of a universal parachuting passport, and he and his wife, Terry, used it to turn the world into their personal playground. After 6,500 jumps, just jumping is not that exciting to me. You want to go somewhere. And I found out really early that expedition skydiving, jumping into unusual and difficult places is a real thrill. Bill and Terry hiked for days in the mountains of Nepal to reach a short, dangerous airstrip at 15,000 feet. From there, it was a perilous plane ride to 30,000 feet to exit above Mount Everest, where the wind chill was minus 105. It was illegal to jump over the pyramids until an Egyptian general's son took up skydiving and invited Booth to make one of the first jumps ever over the Great Pyramid of Giza. 
I saw them down there in free fall, got the parachute open, looked down, and it brought tears to my eyes. When the Crown Prince of Dubai took up skydiving, he hosted Bill and Terry at the seven-star Burj Al Arab Hotel, loaned them his Lamborghini, and arranged a jump for Bill over Palm Island. Getting permission to skydive on Antarctica is nearly impossible, and the cost is outrageous unless you're Bill Booth. Bill and Terry made it all the way to the South Pole, where he completed the elusive Grand Slam of skydiving all seven continents and both poles. Booth consulted with Alan Eustace and his company built the parachute system that Eustace used to jump from the stratosphere, setting a new world freefall record from 135,800 feet. The last 10 years have been one adventure after another, an expedition to Africa with a dip in Devil's Pool at the top of Victoria Falls, a getaway to the Taj Mahal, the Great Wall of China, the Jurassic Park Falls on the island of Kauai, Bora Bora, Australia, England, Mexico, the Bahamas, and many more. I enjoy each new adventure with Bill. Each one is, you come home saying that was the best. So all of them are just been amazing. It's amazing what these machines can do. If he's not traveling, Booth is likely in his factory overseeing production for clients worldwide. For years, he commuted in a seaplane from his home on a spring-fed lake, making quick stops just about whenever and wherever he wanted. I'm going to head down the river south just beyond that boat. That was before he renovated a home on the St. Johns River, providing the opportunity to engage in one of his new passions, classic wooden boats. I'm out in the boat every day, two or three times a day, and I'm in the airplane a couple times a week, you know, so. If he's not traveling, Booth spends his summers on Blue Mountain Lake in the Adirondacks, living in a renovated boathouse with another wooden boat downstairs and his seaplane outside. He's built a life around the people, the places, and the things he loves, and he has no intention of slowing down. When I wake up in the morning, before I try to get out of bed, I pretend I'm 18, you know? And I get out of bed and look in the mirror and realize I'm not. But I can do everything I did when I was 18. It just takes longer, I think. And now I appreciate stuff more. So I think society taught us that after maybe 40, your life was over and useless. <laughs> and it, it's, it's proved not to be true. You can still do neat stuff. And now I'm thinking the same thing I thought 10 years ago. What am I gonna do now? But there's still a lot to do. Bill Booth has created a unique lifestyle that enables him to do what he loves whenever and wherever he wants. He says he feels like he's never worked a day in his life because he loves what he does. So how can we be more like Bill Booth? Well, number one, find a way to make your passion part of your life. Booth wasn't looking for a career. He was simply following his heart. Number two, volunteer if you have to. Become an intern if you need to. Just find a way to make your passion part of your daily life. And number three, be persistent. It might take a while to find a way to monetize your passion, but it's possible no matter how old you are. And if you really love it anyway, the collaboration, the connection to the community might be reward enough. Well, there was a time not so long ago where very few women chose running for fitness. That changed in 1984 when Joan Benoit won gold in the very first women's marathon ever at the Olympics. Not only did she prove that women could run, she made women believe they should. Joan Benoit Samuelson is the queen of the women's running revolution and she's still spreading inspiration today. You're looking at the greatest women's marathon runner in U.S. history, Joan Benoit Samuelson. Still running, still drawing crowds, and still displaying the courage it takes to seek out challenges, set goals, and not just beat them, but smash them. It was 1979 when she went from a nobody to a somebody, winning the Boston Marathon and breaking the previous record by eight full minutes. And that was just the beginning. 
She'd win it again in 83, and in 84 ran into the history books, winning gold in the first ever women's marathon at the Olympics. But Joan is just as much a legend for what she's done since, setting a record at the age of 50 at the U.S. Olympic trials, and at the age of 61, 40 years after that first Boston Marathon, she ran it again and finished within 30 minutes of her original record-setting time. I don't have any secrets. I'm just passionate about what I do, and I love to run, and I love to be outdoors, and love to set goals for myself, and people can grab onto that and be inspired, then great. Today, she is an inspiration, not just for what she's done, but for what she's doing now for others. I promised myself after the Olympics in 84 that I'd give back to a community and a sport that have given so much to me, and I've tried to live by that ever since. I think when you have something in your life that you're passionate about and is easy to access, uh, it just becomes part of your life and part of who you are. And, you know, passion is at the bottom of everything I do. Oh, you're supposed to be running, <laughs> not taking photos. She says her passion now is as strong as it ever was, but she has had to learn the growing importance of patience. Well, I've definitely slowed down, and I've definitely dealt with my share of injuries. And I've learned to be a bit more patient than I was in my earlier years. And, you know, it's an attribute that's necessary if, if your heart's in the game. Everywhere she goes, she's asked about the Olympics and those great marathons of the past. And while she doesn't mind looking back, she says she mostly looks forward. Well, history is history. I mean, the future has so much to offer, I think. And uh, to be able to have the desire to set goals and to keep yourself moving forward uh, is, I think, um, necessary for everyone. There's so many different chapters in your story as to who you are. It's hard to define you. I don't even know who I am. <laughs> you know, every day is different. And I, I you know, I just, I just have passion. Try to live a balanced and full life. And, uh, you know, I, I'll rest when I'm dead, so to speak. <laughs> and that's her advice for the rest of us. Just look forward. Live each day like it's your last. You love a challenge. Is getting older a challenge? No. Life has a beginning and an end, and you know, there is no finish line right now in my life, and when it's there, it's there. Go, Joan! There's a lot we can learn from someone like Joan Benoit Samuelson. Like she said, don't put a finish line in your life either. Don't let anyone convince you that you're too old to try something, to have new adventures, or to explore. And most of all, it is never too late to make a difference in the lives of others. Anyone who has ever been on a team and shared a common goal knows about the lifelong bonds that can form. It doesn't have to be an athletic team. It can be a work team, a volunteer team, a church team. It can be a team of any kind. In today's In Common with Mike Leonard, Mike shares a personal story about the enduring nature of the teammate bond. Hello, Mark. As you know, every now and then we find teammates who are perfectly matched with us, always in sync, a remarkable chemistry that is both magical and unforgettable. With socks pulled over our pants to ward off ticks, Jim Murphy and I walk the Rhode Island woods. He is a retired school teacher and administrator, bird watcher. He hit that, that's the white breast and I had. And former college hockey teammate. Actually, more than a teammate. It's us. What do you mean? You and me. Yeah, yeah. I only knew you for a year. Yeah, I know. But it's like I've known you a long, long time. Yeah. In 1966, before the NCAA allowed college freshmen to play varsity sports, Jim Murphy and I were line mates, along with Skip Sampson, on a very good Providence College freshman hockey team. We played together as a three-man unit for the entire season, supporting each other, backing each other up, anticipating each other's moves. Strangers at first, then teammates, then best friends. Our coach was 24-year-old Lou Lamorello, a tough but fair leader who would go on to become the varsity coach, school athletic director, and NHL Hall of Fame general manager, with three Stanley Cups to his credit. Jim Murphy was a tough kid, but at times impulsive, 
And in that era, impulsivity could get you killed. The Vietnam War was heating up and the U.S. needed more soldiers. All healthy American males over the age of 18 were eligible to be drafted into the military unless enrolled as a full-time college student. One failed or dropped course put your name back in the hopper. And that's what happened to Jim Murphy, his second semester academic problems nullifying his college deferment and sending him to Vietnam as a combat Marine. Skip and I went on to three more years of school and Division I college hockey. Jim Murphy, our line mate, went off to war, a young machine gunner hunting the enemy in the steamy jungles of Southeast Asia. The three of us would never again play a hockey game together. Did people die in your company? Yeah. And how was it, the first time that happened, what, what kind of effect did that have? Well, usually you're shaking, you know, after a firefight, because you don't know what goes on during a firefight. You, you just you just react. I mean, it's just, you, I mean, people could have a machine gun next to my ear. I wouldn't even hear it. Mm -hmm. it you, you just react. And then when, when everything's over and, and the smoke is from the air is, you know, the, the um, artillery uh, lighting up the, mm -hmm. the sky and everything, when that kind of calms down, a helicopter might be coming in to pick up, pick up uh, one of your, your people. And you start, I would shake so hard I couldn't even hold a rifle or after the after. adrenaline, you know, yeah. it's that adrenaline you live on that. So you don't really, I don't, you don't, you know, I didn't make attachments to anybody over there because it didn't last, it, you, nobody really lasted a year, you know. Did you feel that it altered you mentally? Oh, absolutely. I went, boy, I came back uh, absolutely different. He slept with a pistol under his pillow, was agitated and distrustful. Then Lou Lamorello sought him out, offering a new college scholarship and a hockey tryout. Murphy accepted the offer, was eventually named team captain, graduated with honors, and became an educator, positively affecting the lives of more than 5,000 Rhode Island high school students. I made a difference. We do what we can to control as much of our destiny as possible. But the wheel spins. Our fortune or misfortune, sometimes determined by the static pointer of fate. On the evening of December 1st, 1969, millions of college students and other young American men of fighting age anxiously watched as capsules were drawn from a glass jar. September 14th. In each capsule, a piece of paper marked by a month and a day. December 30th. Our birthdays. August 31st. And depending on the order in which they were picked. April 1st is 032. Our fates as draft eligible or not. May 3rd. My number was in the range of those to be called. November 11th. So a few days later, I drove into Providence and enlisted, subsequently passing the cursory group physical before receiving orders to report for military duty a month after my pending graduation in June. The Wheel of Fortune, however, had another spin left fortuitous spin involving a chance encounter on a campus sidewalk during a time of political and social upheaval. In my senior year, a few months before I graduated, I uh, ran into the ROTC commander of the college while walking down this pathway in late afternoon. He knew I had a bad back. He knew I passed the physical. And he wrote down on a piece of paper a doctor's number. He said, go see this man. And I did, and, the man, and that doctor examined my back. And um, a few months later, I got a letter in the mail from Uncle Sam saying that I'm now 4F, physically unable to serve. I hadn't tried to skirt my duty as a soldier, but without being asked, a career military man pulled me, somebody he hardly knew, out of the military and away from the specter of the Vietnam War, where more than 58,000 Americans died and over 300,000 were wounded. Was the quiet intercession his way of adjusting the ledger, protecting a life? And why was I the one to benefit, while Jim Murphy, the best and truest teammate of my hockey life, was still paying a life-altering price for one flunked college course? I still have some problems. Um, at least once or twice a week, maybe, in the middle of the night, I'm attacking somebody. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah. But the soldier soldiers on as we must all, together. Jim Murphy of Burrowville, Rhode Island, Skip Sampson of Stoneham, Massachusetts, and Mike Leonard of Chicago, Illinois. Hockey line mates for one year 
and friends for life. We are now in our early 70s. Skip is battling cancer with courage and a smile. Murph and I are battling with him in spirit and with a catch in my throat when thinking about how we played together and how we stayed together. My line mate, my center, I was the left wing. Skippy's not here, he was on the right one. Yeah. And we had a good line, right? And, and it, was, it was amazing, you know? And I only know him for basically six months and now it's like we're almost brothers. At least that's how I feel. Yeah, you're a tough guy too. We were good. We all complimented. We each had our own specialty. Too bad I didn't stay, but maybe then there had to be a reason. There had to be a reason. We need pain, we need bumps, we need yeah. disappointments, we need failures, right? To learn. Yeah, yeah. You don't know until you, you, you fall down and get pick yourself back up and you learn something. Right. Right, and we did. And we did. Whether in sports or other endeavors, people who team up to help each other succeed in pursuit of a unified goal forge a bond that could very well last a lifetime. Hi, I'm Laura Savini. Do you wonder why some people seem to age better than others? Is it genetics, personality, wealth? Well, Daniel Levitin is a neuroscientist and best-selling author. We asked him to give us three key ingredients to successful aging. Here's what we got. One of them is don't retire. That, for a number of reasons that I go into in the book and, and have in, in longer form interviews, is really the death of, uh, of health, uh, brain and bodily health for most people. Now, if you do have to retire, you should, ret not, you should retire from something to something else. Again, it could be volunteerism. It doesn't really matter. But having a sense of purpose, having to be at a certain place at a certain time, having to interact with other, other people, what you and I are doing right now, having a conversation gets to the number two piece of advice, which is keep meeting new people. Having a conversation is the most complex cognitive operation for the brain that we know of. It's more complicated than brain surgery. I can tell you that because I teach brain surgeons is, is part of my teaching. Uh, that's not that complicated. It's basically a bunch of plumbing. Uh, and then the, the third piece is um, practice gratitude. If you're happy with what you have and not focused on what you lack, you'll be happy. That's Daniel Levitin with three keys to successful aging. He says, don't retire, keep meeting new people, and always practice gratitude. But still, you know, we have those times in our lives when we worry. Are we as sharp as we used to be? Maybe we're gaining weight, we're slowing down. Well, growing bolder contributor Barbara Hannah Grufferman experienced those emotions. And here's what she had to say. When I turned 50, I was really feeling Oh, what I like to call the umpies. I was feeling a grumpy, a little lumpy, a little frumpy feeling. And so I wanted to do something better for myself. And I didn't have a lot of time, career, and husband, and, and children, and you know, a life. And I said, well, what can I do? What's the most efficient thing I can do that I can really work into my life? And for me, it started with walking. And I started, I just bought myself a great pair of walking shoes. And then I started to run a little bit. And then I started to go longer and a little faster. And I started to run more then walk, and then finally there I was running. And then, don't you know, I signed up for my very first New York City Marathon about, uh, I want to say about eight years ago, and now I'm training for my seventh New York City Marathon. Well, look, you don't have to run a marathon to age successfully. That's certainly not in my future. But it sure helps if you find something you like to do and then you give it your best effort. It can be physical or it can be a hobby or a special cause. The point is, keep seeking new experiences, stay curious, and connect with others as often as you can. If you're having trouble figuring out who you are or how you can make a difference, Mahatma Gandhi once said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. John Wooden, the great Hall of Fame basketball coach said, it's impossible to live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. At Growing Boulder, we call it moving forward by giving back. 
We've interviewed countless men and women who found their passion and their purpose simply by finding a way to help others. You don't have to change the world, but you can change your life for the better simply by helping others. A simple act of kindness can change someone's day and maybe even their life. Remember that making a difference isn't about age, it's about attitude. And leaving a legacy isn't about money, it's about intent. Simply trying to make the world better will ensure that you're remembered. Ultimately, our legacy is simply the stories that others tell about us when we're gone. So ask yourself, what stories will people tell about you? That's your legacy. If you don't like it, give them better stories to tell, because that's growing bolder. We'll see you next time. about all of the stories you've seen here today is available at growingbolder.com slash TV. And you can go bold when you connect with the Growing Boulder community on Facebook and Instagram. Get Growing Boulder Magazine four quarterly issues delivered to your home for $29.97 a year. A companion book, Growing Boulder by Mark Middleton, is available as well for $25 plus shipping and handling. Growing Boulder membership includes access to a robust online platform featuring tools, tips, and resources in personal finance, functional fitness, caregiving, brain health, entrepreneurism, and more. Available for $30 for one year. Order online at growingboulder.com slash TV.